welcome everyone to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and you have clicked play on, we really hope you've clicked subscribe to, a podcast that talks about crucible experiences. What are crucible experiences, you might ask, if this is your first time with us, or even if it's uh, your fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh time and we've never really explained it to you before. A crucible experience is an event that can happen to you, uh, can be caused by you. It's something that knocks the wind out of your sails. Traumas, tragedies, setbacks, failures, those things that can truly change the trajectory of your life. But here's the good news of why we talk about them on this show. We don't talk about them so we can build a virtual campfire and we can swap war stories about how terrible our lives are because of our crucibles. We talk about them to map ways beyond them, to find ways to learn the lessons of them, apply them to our lives moving forward so that we can live what we call at Crucible Leadership, a life of significance. And the author of everything I've just described to you, the architect of it, the Lego master of it, I say sometimes, is the founder of Crucible Leadership, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, uh, welcome to what's going to be um, uh, a, a good show. Absolutely. Very much looking forward to it. Listener, I say it's going to be a good show because <clears throat> I've had a chance to talk a little bit with our guest uh, before uh, we hit record. And uh, I always read a biography of the guest before we get started. And our guest today doesn't know that I actually swiped her biography off her LinkedIn page because it's so good. So I'm going to read. <laughs> our guest is Emily Harmon. And it's how she it's how Emily describes herself on her LinkedIn page. And it is just, I when this is over, I'm gonna go change my LinkedIn page to have this kind of energy because it's really good. <laughs> so here's how Emily Harmon, our guest today, describes herself on her LinkedIn page. I'm a coach, but a coach with a difference. I've got the heart of a mom, the mind of a senior executive, and the experience of a naval officer. I've performed studies and written policies on plastic waste reduction. I've awarded contracts worth millions for weapons systems. I've advised the Secretary of the Navy on small business issues. But following my own advice was my greatest achievement. I listened to my inner voice and now I help my clients find theirs. I lead the Onward Movement and host the Onward Podcast. A little Tai Chi, a little watercolor, a lot of hiking. That's what my week looks like. And she ends her LinkedIn bio by saying, what about yours? Well, we're going to find a little bit more about Emily uh, through this interview. Uh, Warwick, take it away. This is going to be uh, fun and hopeful and insightful. Indeed. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend, uh, Steve Pimpo, who... Uh, also a U.S. Naval Academy um, graduate, and uh, as listeners probably know, even though I'm from Australia, I live in Annapolis, Maryland, where the Naval Academy is, even though I have no involvement or experience whatsoever with the Navy, but I live in Annapolis, a wonderful town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful it's having, a beautiful town. Wonderful having Thank you for having me. Oh, not at all. Wonderful, you know, having the mids there. So I love what you do with Onward uh, Movement and the podcast in particular, trying to uh, empower women in particular to live authentic lives, to live uh, free of judgment, uh, to live their dreams. I mean, it's a, I don't want to say a sacred calling, but uh, it's, it's a wonderful calling. But you've had a, an amazing journey, uh, obviously leading up to uh, your you know, career in the, in the Navy and government service. So talk about uh, Emily Harmon growing up, sort of your family influences that led to the Naval Academy and probably ultimately in some ways led to Onward Movement. So who was sort of a young teenage high school environment? You know, who was Emily Harmon kind of growing up? Well, um, basketball is what I would say got me to where I am today. And the reason I say that is because when I was like um, in sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade, I started to play basketball and I was like five, six, uh, about 95 pounds, uncoordinated. Um, 
And so growing up, my parents were not in the military, but what they told uh, me and my brother and sister, the three of us is, you know, if you do well in sports, we'll pay for your college or, you know, thinking that it would get us into college, which it did for all of us. And, um, or you can work and then you can pay for your clothes and, and, and all that. So we'll kind of take care of you as long as you're, you know, applying yourself at sports. So I used to have to jump rope for 10 minutes every morning before I got breakfast. And I appreciate my parents for having me do that because that got me coordinated. And my dad worked two jobs and still spent a lot of time on the weekends helping me learn to play basketball. I was left-handed. He helped me learn to shoot left hand, right-handed, do a hook shot. So many things uh, my father taught me. And it wasn't until I became a parent myself that I realized what a sacrifice that was for him to be spending his free time with me and my brothers and sisters too. Um, and so in high school, I became the leading scorer in Maryland, DC and Virginia. And I could have scored 40 points and my dad would say, good game. Now, you remember that time when you went right, you should have gone left. And <laughs> my point of that is the way I reacted to that as a first child the firstborn, and he was trying to help me. But the way I reacted to that, I can see now looking back is I became a pleaser. I tried to really please him. And then that translated into being a pleaser in other aspects of my life. And, you know, firstborns are typically hyperachievers. I became, you know, I was a hyperachiever and I was always striving to improve in my whole life, always striving to do better. And not celebrating any wins. If I did, it would be like a, a second, like, all right, I, I got that. Let me move on to the next thing. And that, you know, translated, you know, that childhood translated in my life, which I'm sure we'll get into about how, how it impacted my life um, in positive and, you know, not so positive ways. And so I was recruited by several colleges to play basketball. West Point was one of them. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it was cold and rainy and gray. And then I went to the Naval Academy and I know you've been there and it was sunny <laughs> and I, I, and I liked the basketball team and I liked the, the people there. And, and I decided to go there because I didn't know that much about the Navy, but I also knew that education would be the number one thing. Like if I ever got hurt playing basketball or something, I would still, I wouldn't lose a scholarship. I would still get my education. And that was a good decision because when I was there, I had two knee surgeries. Made, uh, reconst I tore my anterior cruciate ligament, um, but I still got a good education and, and graduated. So that's how my, my life started out. And that's why I say basketball has got me to where I am today. You know, what's fascinating about your story, Emily, is you know, we've had all sorts of you know, men, women, all kinds of backgrounds, races. <clears throat> Some folks come from very difficult families, you know, maybe abusive or it may be parents who just were never there. But it sounds like uh, your upbringing wasn't that bad. I mean, in the sense that you had loving parents that cared about you. Maybe you could say in hindsight, you know, I mean, I don't know that they had all the psychology books or people weren't quite as aware of parenting years ago. And so the resources weren't there. But it sounds like you had, you know, uh, supportive parents that wanted the best for you and your siblings. Now, you may have translated it into like a performance achievement mm -hmm. uh, way of thinking, but I think what's fascinating for listeners is you don't have to come from some terrible broken home to have challenges, and you might have very loving parents that are trying to do their best, but unwittingly kids can interpret things differently. Does that make sense? Like it's, it, didn't, it doesn't sound like you had a horrific upbringing. You know, it doesn't sound no, like it's I didn't. So bad, I didn't. You know? I, you know, I was able to go away to summer camp for like seven weeks in the summer and, you know, horseback ride and do arts and crafts. I mean, my parents, um, you know, gave us a lot of opportunity. Um, there, you know, no parents are perfect. I'm not a perfect parent either. And I would say that I never saw my parents argue. They got married six weeks after they got after they met. They're still married 50, 59 years later. Wow. But I didn't, I didn't really see conflict resolution and I didn't really see holding hands. I didn't really see, it wasn't like a warm, loving relationship that I saw. Um, so, you know, we just pick up on different things. I think that in some ways I, 
I haven't really talked to them about this, but I can look back and feel there were times when I didn't feel heard or seen. And so it was so interesting when I founded the Onward Movement in 2020, I did some, ex I did an exercise with one of my coaches where, and I do it now for my clients, where she helped me by reflecting on my childhood and what was missing in my life from my perspective. Um, she had us come up with what our purpose in life, our purpose for being here. And the words that, that I came up with were words that I had already put in the manifesto that I created for the Onward Movement, which was, we see you, we hear you. Mm. This is a welcoming place. And although we, we, we strive to improve ourselves, we know we're enough just the way we are. These are things that I've had challenges with in my life that I then put into the manifesto that then when I did this exercise with my coach came up as my purpose for being here in life. It was so amazing. It just brought tears to my eyes to see that correlation. And I do that for my clients and I bring tears to their eyes too, because it's just amazing to really come into a better understanding of why we're really here. It's so fascinating that the manifesto you have for your movement to help other folks and other women in some sense subconsciously came out of your own challenges, you know? And it's, yeah. It's, and again, you know, the, the psychology books and parenting books, it was just not there, you know, even sort of conflict resolution, you know, you know if, if you're not, ha I mean, you don't have to yell and scream to have conflict. You can have constructive conflict but you know when there's no tension or there's no uh conflict that needs to get resolved that's never a good sign you know and, it, uh, and the tension can be like yeah the tension can be somebody giving somebody else a silent treatment well, okay and you can pick up on that that's tension well absolutely and we want it the best for our kids but it's so uh, dangerous almost when we say hey you know johnny susie hey that was great but you know, there's another level and you don't hear that was great. You hear it's another level. You missed the whole, right. the whole, right. the whole first part. And people didn't think about that back then. And no. you know, I, I know with my own kids and, you know, like 30 into 20, certainly something I was very, so, you know, one of my parents was pretty driven, was definitely one of the, hey, that was great, Warwick, but, you know, <laughs> definitely, yeah. you know, she was uh, very, very driven. Uh, but with my own kids, I was trying to say, hey, that's great. And if they say, yeah, I'm not good at this and say, no, you're fantastic. So look, I'm not perfect, but I really try. I'm sure if you have with your kids lean into uh, not, you know, it's like it's like when people apologize, you know, it's like, I'm sorry if, which is never an apology. That means there's right. nothing. It's like, right. that was great, but that's not right. affirmation. Great right. but is right. never should be in your vocabulary uh, ever. It's great, period. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but so let's fast forward. So you're, you're in the Navy and what's fascinating is it's not like you grew up thinking, I want to be in the military. It's just, it was a logical choice and a wise choice, as you said, blowing, blowing out your knees. Uh, and it's not like your parents said military is what you need to do, but you did. So you're in the Naval Academy and you launch into the Navy. So talk about as your career and life unfolds, you get married, have kids. I mean, you're sort of obviously a driven person. So talk about yeah. the Naval Academy on. What was the next steps like for you in your life? All right, I will talk about that. What's interesting too, is my sister went to the Naval Academy. Wow. She was a, a freshman when I was a senior and my brother went to the Air Force Academy. So all three of us went to military <laughs> academies. Now my brother ended up leaving after two years. Um, um, he was out of all of us, he was the one with the better grades and everything, but yeah. So, I mean, it's amazing. Two parents with no military background. My dad couldn't have be in the military because he blew his knee out in high school and he, so he couldn't serve in Vietnam or the Korean war and, uh, they wouldn't let him in, but yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, I, I, um, graduated and I got stationed. I went into the supply corps, which is how I, I knew Steve Pimpo. You mentioned he introduced mm -hmm. us. He was my classmate at the Naval Academy. And um, we both were in the supply corps, which is like the business end of the Navy. So after I went to supply corps school in Athens, Georgia, I was stationed on a ship, a submarine tender. And then 
the, that ship, uh, the steel decks and everything really hurt my knees. I had had knee surgery mm -hmm. on both of my knees. And um, so after a couple of years, two and a half years or so, I got off that ship and then I went to work for the Atlantic Fleet, which is where I helped do a study on how much plastic the Navy was dumping into the ocean. This was in the mid 80s when plastic was just washing up on the shores all the time and medical mm -hmm. waste. And the ships would just dump everything off overboard. So we did studies. And um, now if you go on a ship, you'll see they have these things. I don't know if they call them plastic waste processors anymore, but they recycle a lot of the plastic and bring it out in, you know, balls or discs or whatever. So there's a lot of recycling that goes on in board ships now. And then I got stationed back at the Naval Academy or I helped coach basketball and I taught leadership and I was a company officer. And that's when I met my kid's father and we got married and I just decided I didn't want to go back to to see again and raise children. So I, I got out of the Navy after seven years working on active duty and I became a civilian working for the Navy in government contracting. That's what I was doing at the time. And then I just, I did 13 years in the reserves. So I did 20 total. And then I stayed on as a civilian and I ended up getting divorced from my children's father. He was verbally abusive and the pleaser that I had developed, uh, kept putting up with that. And I didn't leave until I could see it impacting my children. So that's where that pleaser personality did not serve me well there. I tried everything to make that marriage work, but in the long run, verbal, verbal abuse is really, um, tough to overcome. And, uh, I uh, still think it impacts me to this day, but, um, so we ended up divorcing and then I was a single parent, you know, and so a lot of my career was pushing through just, I coach in energy levels now. So uh, on a scale of one to seven energy levels, I would say I was at energy level three. And at that energy level, you push through and you look at the bright side of things and you find the silver lining and all that's great. However, what you don't do is you don't really pay much attention to your feelings because they get in the way of you pushing through. So I spent a lot of my career being a hyperachiever, moving up, moving up, moving up, never feeling satisfied with how, where I was always trying to do more and achieve more raising my kids. Um, and, and ignoring my feelings. I didn't know all this in my head. You know, I didn't really, I wasn't aware of this consciously, you know, what I was doing. Um, I sense that I've learned, you know, how I was ignoring my feelings. And I'll explain the way that happened is, so it was 2019, my kids were grown. I had made it to the equivalent of a two-star admiral in the reserves. I mean, in the, um, as a civilian, I was the director of the Office of Small Business Programs for the Navy and the Marine Corps, We're advising the Secretary of the Navy and all Navy leadership and responsible for the whole program on how we provided opportunities for small businesses to participate in government contracting. So I had made it up pretty high, but I still, something was missing. I didn't know what it was. And I was tired of being busy. I was busy all the time. And I thought it was my job. I was busy all the time and I knew I wasn't feeling my feelings and I kind of felt like I was turning into my, some of the things that bothered me about my mom. That's the way she is. She's busy. She's always fine. And so I didn't want to be that way anymore. So I decided that I was going to retire. I was going to retire from the Navy with that in my mind, that job and the work I had done for the Navy was causing all of my stress. So I retired and I figured now I can relax. I can <laughs> be who I want to be. I can do what I want to do. And, but who am I? What do I want to be? And I'll pause now if you have any questions and then I'll go to what happened next. But it's like, where did Emily go? Cause she's buried under all of these responsibilities and pushing through and not feeling your feelings. I didn't even know myself anymore. There's a phrase on your website. I think you talk about the chameleon, or chameleon yeah. Emily versus the real Emily. And it feels like your whole life, you're, you know, I mean, you're an achiever. I think you write somewhere you're in the sixth class at the Naval Academy that admitted women, which 
you know, uh, certainly forget back then, even today, it certainly does not seem easy to be a woman in the military or you read about the terrible stuff, uh, you know, appropriate, inappropriate things that are going on and you wonder, will people ever learn? But it looks like maybe no. Uh, I know, <laughs> yeah. you know, from a faith perspective, you say, you know, people are all fallen. Well, it sure seems like there's all, an awful lot of fallen people out there doing terrible things. But anyway, but back when you started, there probably wasn't even as much um, spotlight on those things uh, the way there is no. today. But so right. sixth class, Again, it's funny, when I went to Oxford, um, my year was the very first year that Oxford admitted women. So the women's colleges admitted men and the men's colleges admitted women. So they were a brave, uh, a very bla a brave lot and courageous and seemed like it, it worked out okay as far as I could see. But, but anyway, so you've got these different strands, it's determination, but yet there's people pleasing. And um, for some people, they might think, well, somebody is so determined and so courageous, how could you put up with things that weren't inappropriate, but yet people do. You probably know many women in particular who are equally as determined as you are. And so help folks understand that, that bit of that psychology, because it seems like what you're so determined, you, you could accomplish anything, you could break through any barrier, right? If, ever, yeah. if there's any somebody I'm gonna bet on, it's Emily Harmon, she can, she can break through anything. She is tough, she is strong, but yeah, there's something about that people-pleasing mentality that, I don't know, help us understand that because it, it's an interesting dichotomy. Well, I wish I understood it 100% because um, I'm in, I'm a coach in an area called positive intelligence, um, which is about strengthening your mental fitness. And it's all about understanding these saboteurs in our mind. And two of mine are the hyperachiever saboteur and the pleaser. And these are basically the way Shirzad Shamin from this program who developed this program talks about it is like these saboteurs in our minds, what causes all our stress. And they're really started with being, with being strengths, but they're strengths that are overused by the left side of your brain, the saboteur side of your brain. And they push you with anxiety. And I, and, and stress, they cause all your stress and anxiety. So I could have, and I, right now I'm a, I, I can be a I can achieve, but I achieve through my right side of my brain, my sage with my heart. Mm -hmm. I'm not pushing, I'm not striving to prove anything to anybody. So there's a difference. So my saboteur, when I use it, it, when, when it, when it becomes a, you know, a, um, it just hinders me and causes all of my stress. And so that's what my pleaser did. I can, I love to serve people. I love to coach people. That's what I do right now. But if I do that too much, then I start to get resentful and get stressed and not feel not appreciated. So I need to, you know, and if I'm trying to please somebody because to make them happy all the time, and that doesn't help. And so, you know, I just, I just didn't, you know, and so somebody asked, um, Shirzad, can you, can you have like some s different saboteurs at work than you have at home? And he said, yeah, you can. There's a lot of people like that. So I didn't have a pleaser saboteur as much at work as I did at home. It was like, I was two different people. I mm -hmm. am still working to figure out how can, how could I have put up with that verbal abuse? Why did I have such a low self-esteem that made me put up with being called bad names and things like that for like not loading the dishwasher correctly or leaving my son's pacifier in the trunk when he was in the car and he needed it right then. I mean, those or not knowing, um, not telling him, not handling, handing him the toll money in the right way. These are all like ridiculous things that most people who knew me would think I would never put up with that. But it wasn't until I couldn't even leave the house to go for a walk because my kids didn't want to be alone with him. And he never hit me. But I think verbal abuse is just as bad as hitting. Nobody can see it. Nobody can see the bruises. Nobody can see it. Yeah. And um, yeah. and so, you know, I, I don't quite yet understand why, but it, I think it's very common for that to happen. Yeah, I, I mean... It is. I'm no expert. I mean, without getting into all the details, I had some, I'm bout with verbal abuse when I was young from a close family member, and it does it can erode your 
self-esteem. And uh, I remember sort of initially I'd push back and I'd be like six, eight, very young and I'd push back, but then eventually, you know, it would wear me down and, you know, I'd say, I'm so sorry yeah. and that kind of cycle. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm no psychologist, but I think one of the things we talk a lot here is uh, the question of identity. And if it's like, well, who is Emily Harmon? Well, she is an achiever. She's a pupil mm-hmm. pleaser. But but who are you beneath that? And if it's like the, and the whole Shemulian uh, word is like, maybe it's like, well, you were saying to yourself, I don't really know who I am. Um, there's right. all these these roles I play, like, like, a, like yeah. a, almost a Greek tragedy or something. There, there are these roles <laughs> I play, these masks I put on. But who am I but beneath the mask? I don't know. I mean, you obviously now, you, you know, far more about who you are and, the Emily mm-hmm. Harmon today is not going to put up with, you know, inappropriate mm-hmm. behavior or abuse or whatever, because you know who you are, right? And, yeah, I know who I am, and I love myself. Well, exactly. And I have compassion for myself. And I, I think back then, I, I didn't love myself. Um, definitely not like today. And so what happened when I retired, when I called my retirement a graduation? Thinking, <laughs> yes, now I can create, I can do what yeah. I want. And yeah. um and then I figured that with all this time on my hands, like I didn't have to work mm-hmm. that, and I knew I wanted to be a coach and a podcast host, but I figured with all this time on my hands that I am going to have time to work out. I'm just going to, you know, have time to get up in the morning and just, I'm going to be so much more relaxed. I knew that's what would happen. And it did not, it did not happen. So my point there is, is that a lot of times we think, well, when circumstances change, when this happens or that happens, and if only this wasn't in my life, if only I didn't work with these people, if I did this, we tend to point our finger at the other circumstances or situations. And when we do that, we have, I've learned, we have three fingers pointing back at us. So that was like my crucible moment. Like I have got to look at me. Why am I not slowing down? Why do I still have this other saboteur, which I haven't mentioned yet, which is restless? I'm always like, let me sign up for that class. Let me do that. Let me do that. (laughs) And then my condo starts to, my outer world starts to reflect my inner world of unorganized disarray, stress, anxiety, my outer world, my condo is not clean. I've got these different projects not completed. And so I've worked with coaches for the past two and a half years to figure that out. And then I also had to start feeling my feelings because what happened is three weeks after I retired, my daughter called and told me that her dad, the verbally, the guy who'd been verbally abusive to me had cancer. And then two weeks after that, he was paralyzed in both arms from his cancer and he died five months later. And that when that happened and my daughter helped take care of him, I helped take care of him. And when when that happened, I saw a man die with regrets Mm. and I got closure, um, like a couple nights before he died in December, I said, you know, a couple nights ago would have been our 28th wedding anniversary. And Mm -hmm. he just looked at me and he shook his head And he turned away and he said, I'm sorry. And he told my son, I'm sorry, I wasn't there for you when you needed me. My son had, um, is an alcoholic. He's like almost six years sober, but you know, for, from age 13 to 23, it was very, 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 very hard. I didn't know if I was going to get a call that he was dead from drugs and alcohol. So, uh, and I didn't have a, um, his dad wasn't there, you know, Bruce was not there for us. And so I saw him die with regrets. He was a civil servant. He was a retired army officer. He was a West Point grad. He had done all these things. He had these files. He had been successful at work, but not with his friends and family. And he had all these files on what he was going to do when he retired and he never got to retire. He died at 64, just like that. That is why I that woke me up and that is why i help people create a life they love living now don't wait for circumstances to change it's now and we can do it now so that was part of the i think epiphany you've mentioned earlier and elsewhere you know you went to 2014 uh international world domination summit and then 
the, the incident in 2018 where you're kind of riding the subway to the Pentagon and all these faceless people with the ear pods and, you know, you're on this treadmill and you decided to get off. I mean, there was still mm-hmm. inner work to be done, but that was the catalyst, right? 2018, that was the catalyst. 2019, like, you decided, yeah. I'm leaving my government career and I'm doing something new. And one of the other fascinating things you said, I think initially your first idea was, I'm going to keep achieving, right? This is going to be my my first, I'm going to keep, now I can achieve in a different direction. Uh, yeah. So talk yeah. about that, that that sort of, there's a bit of an epiphany and a turn, obviously, you know, your, your husband, ex-husband dying, all of those things, it seems like they helped you turn not just outward, but the, you could say the ultimate voyage of discovery is the journey inward. And definitely and you began, when Bruce died, I was, yeah, I was angry. I was pissed off at him and, and I was for the way he had treated us. And then I was sad for him. And, you know, I still loved him, even though he had been verbally abusive, I still loved him. And it just made me sad the way he lived his life. And my kids saw it too. And, um, you know, everything fell on me to help my kids through it. You can see in here, there's a picture of him right up there. This is where oh, my wow. son sits. I'm at my son's house and he sits and talks yeah. to his dad. And I saw yeah. my kids go through the base, his basement and learn about their dad that way because Bruce hadn't really shared much about his career as a test pilot and things like that. And, and so, you know, all the feelings from the divorce, all the feelings that I had shoved down when I was in that energy of push, push, push came to the surface. I was a mess. And I started to learn how to feel my feelings. And I started to realize that I had lived mostly in the left side of my brain, lived in my head, not connected to my intuition, not connected to my gut, not, not just, you know, logic a lot and that's navy right the right. dod is all charts right. and graphs and you know and so the next level of energy i tend to go to is level five which is where you can see a whole bunch of opportunities and i do see that i see opportunity in this this and this and this and then what happens is and that's that restless saboteur in my mind i get paralyzed by all these opportunities and i get stressed and i go down to energy level one which is oh, i give up i can't do it So I've learned so much about myself. I can put words to my different energy levels and how I show up. And now I am, it didn't happen overnight like I thought it would. It wasn't because of my job that I was restless and hyperachiever. It was because I had internalized that and I needed to see who Emily was beneath that. Really? I am intuitive and now I live a lot of my life in like energy level seven, which is the highest energy level, which you would know it when you see a four or five year old, just the way they look at the world. Right. That's how I live a lot of my life. Now it's amazing. I'm so calm. I'm just relaxed. I'm not pushing and clients come to me. The universe sends people to me and I'm not like chasing clients or money or whatever I am being and it's awesome wow. I never thought I, I never thought I could be this way I thought that it was my personality to be like push 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 and achieve 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 and you know do all these different projects and not be in the moment wow but now I'm in the moment you know I think I want listeners to hear what Emily said because I really feel like in using different words the chameleon Emily is gone, doesn't exist. Yeah. It's the real Emily Harmon, the one that, mm-hmm. you know, from my faith perspective, you know, uh, God or whoever's up there always intended you to be, you know, have yes. one, what faith paradigm one, one uses. I think one of the things I've learned myself and just from other guests on the podcast is sometimes there can be gift and tragedy. Nobody wants to go through what you did with your ex-husband with verbal abuse being at his bedside and he's in tears apologizing, which is probably, it's something, it's better than not apologizing. It doesn't, it doesn't make up for everything, yeah. but it's, it's a little something. Uh, but that forced you to take stock and just to change direction. And I know in my own life, obviously, 
the listeners are very well aware of the 150-year-old family media business. And, you know, I was never in the military, but definitely had a duty on a country mindset. My life is worthless. It's all about the cause, all for the cause. You know, it's very, uh, I was very much uh, into that concept. But yeah, one of the other things I don't always talk about is uh, my dad was married three times and my mother twice. And I saw the toll that divorce took on my older uh, siblings, the expectations, you've got to be in the family business. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, frankly, uh, my father didn't exactly make, let's just say, wise decisions when it came to marriage um, in general. Let's just put it that way. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be that person. I do not want to be that guy. And so I'm blessed that I met an American girl in Australia in the late 80s, and we married like, I don't know, 32 years. And I was so focused on, I did, I did not want that to be me, but it could be. And I had zero mm-hmm. confidence in my own judgment because we can all be mm-hmm. foolish. So yeah. even before I married my wife, Gail, I asked her, somebody was mentoring me at the time and some buddies, what do you think? I wanted to make sure there was green light all the way around. And yeah, she's a fantastic person who's, selfless, no expectations. Uh, when the company went under, there was no like, oh, you idiot. It's just unconditional love. I mean, I'm unbelievably blessed. Well, that didn't happen in a vacuum. That happened because yeah. I saw what happened to my both my parents. And I didn't want that to me. Again, I'm not a perfect parent. Nobody is. But I'm sh- with my kids, it's like I had this whole expectation thrust on me. It's, it's like, that's not going to be. I'm going to be present. I don't care what they do so long as they're happy. So I'm not so it's not that I'm so wonderful. It's because of the experiences I had that mm-hmm. made me veer pretty hard in a different direction. And I'm, so mm-hmm. like you, the experiences you've had, you know, you the way you are with, you know, your kids uh, now, and I'm sure with the women that, you know, you mentor, those tragedies, they're, they're hard the hard won lessons that come from that, but there's a gift amidst the pain that you're using for your family and for women and others all over the place. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Is you, you're making Definitely. use of that pain, if you will. Yeah. We can find a gift or an opportunity in everything. And I've told my kids, you know, I always told my kids that your dad loves you. He, he suffered from anxiety. We didn't have that term for back then he was also an alcoholic but he, he never really went to get help it was always if you do this if you do that so but I but I always tell my kids that you know he loved you as best that he could in his way and I we also talk about the the gift and the opportunity in his passing you know for them to also realize how short life is and to create a life they love living and you know my son is just finishing up two years of, well, it's been longer than two years, but his associate's degree in engineering, and he's getting a little stressed and I think he's going to stop and go, he was doing it full time. He's going to stop and go to work and, and see if this is really what he, what he wants to do. And he was, I think a little nervous to tell me, I'm like, well, you're, I'm your mom. I coach people in creating a life they love living. (laughs) If going to college like this is stressing you out and you're not sure if you want to be an engineer, that's okay. (laughs) It's it's not that it's that surprising. Uh, I also have a son named Will. I mean, it's not like it's that strange a name, but Uh yeah, I have I have a Will too. It's funny we have a little uh, thing in his room that a family member did that said, you know, where there's a Will, there's a way. It's a little comic, (laughs) comic thing, but. yeah, so talk a bit about onward movement. And I think as we transition, you know, the hope, there's probably a bunch of high achievers, um, listening, executives, military, even, a, even you can even be in the world of faith and, you know, be a missionary and have a high achievement mentality. And mm-hmm. I'm not against achievement. I mean, you know, for whatever reason, and as you know, listeners would understand, I did my undergrad at Oxford, worked on Wall Street, have an MBA from Harvard Business School. So it's not like I'm you know, don't try to achieve things. But um, achievement in of itself doesn't make us happy. And, you know, strong, courageous people do what you do and what you advocate. They make the inner journey. I mean, I've sought counseling years ago after the whole company went under because I was in pretty bad shape in a good part of the 90s. That inward journey to understand who we are, we, we can't help anybody. Uh, least of uh, least of the that ourselves if we don't do that inner journey if we don't take care of ourselves 
not only are we not going to be able to care for others, we'll probably hurt other people. It's kind of inevitable. Yeah. Our, your, inner, your inner pain spreads, almost like cancer or poison, not to get too graphic. Your friends and family in the world, it doesn't deserve you know, your pain kind of hurting them. Not that you want to, but that inner no. journey that you do, it's so important. It's not a sign of, it's a sign of strength to say, yep, you, know, you didn't grow up in this horrendous upbringing, but we all have pain and brokenness and you got to deal with it, whether it's you know, spiritually through counseling, whatever your truth is. It's so critical. So I just want listeners to really understand what uh, Emily is saying. So talk a bit about onward movement, because that is that is maybe the mission that you were put on this earth to advocate for. You just didn't know it <laughs> when you were young. Yeah, but yeah. Talk about well, it's you know, on, I'll, onward I'll talk movement. About- yeah. yeah, and that in my podcast. So it, the onward movement is kind of part of this journey that I'm on. So when I retired, I, I did start the onward podcast. I didn't start the onward movement right away, but I've published over like 150, 170 episodes of the onward mm. podcast. And initially it's all been the onward podcast, but they've ha- it's had different subtitles. So it was the onward podcast, facing adversity and moving forward. Well, that was my life, right? Energy level three, face adversity, push forward. Right. And I interviewed people on how they had done that. And, and some people were, were more advanced spiritually and in their life and in their inner journey than me. And I didn't always understand everything that they were telling me when I was interviewing. It was interesting because my awareness wasn't there. Then I switched it to onward podcast, facing adversity, moving forward and discovering ourselves along the way. Cause I learned we really discover ourselves. Now I've changed it to create a life you love living now. And mm. in, it was in April of 2020, right after COVID hit that I started the onward movement. And now it's always been since then a Facebook group pretty much. And I have an email address of about almost close to 1500 people now of people mm. who are looking to create a life they love living um, to release that fear of what other people might say and to embrace their authentic self so that they can do that. Uh, create a life of their dreams, a life they would really love. And so I developed a manifesto. I've got a coaching program around that onward movement, which is kind of outlined some of the steps I went through um, to really get back to myself. Um, And eventually we're going to start having, now that COVID is lifting a little bit, we're going to start having some live events where we can get together and maybe do a retreat but, but I do a lot of posting in there, go live. I hold some Zoom meetings and things like that where we're all talking about, you know, encouraging each other to really go for creating the life of our dreams and realizing that um, life is short and we can do that. And we create a space, a safe space for people to have some of these discussions and share some of their hardships and help each other along the way. I want to jump in at this point because there's something you said at the very start of this conversation, Emily, that's been been tickling the back of my mind. And 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 I know why now you began talking about when Warwick asked you to sort of tell your backstory, you said, well, it all starts with basketball. Right. The basketball was kind of the organizing construct of your life. It got you into the military. Um, Now, unlike you. While I played city league basketball, I never led one state, let alone three in scoring like you did. (laughs) But I used to have a saying that I would say all the time that I applied from basketball to life. And that was, if you want to score, you got to shoot the jumper. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're talking about when you talk about create a life you love living now, embrace your authentic self. In some ways, you could apply a basketball metaphor to that to say, you've got to shoot. You've got to be in the game. You've got to to have the courage to take the shot. I I think it was Michael uh, Jordan who stole a line from Wayne Gretzky who said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You've got to take your shot, right? If you want to embrace your authentic self and create a life you want to live now. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And then the other thing is somebody might look at me and say, oh, well, she's got her, you know, I'm getting ready to, to release a new updated website. Um, she's got her website. She's got her message clear. She's got this. She's got that. I don't know if I could start a business. I don't know if I could be a coach. I don't know. And the thing is, is that nothing was clear. I just sh- took the shot. Right. Right. And I just kept shooting. And I have not missed publishing a podcast weekly since June 
first 2019, even through mm -hmm. Bruce's sickness and death, I continued to, you know, do that. I continued to put one foot forward and, and, and keep moving forward towards my dream of becoming a, a coach. I had to put off getting certified. Uh, I'm getting certified, um, you know, in the next month or so, but I had to put that off initially because he was sick. I, I, once again, you know, I was getting ready to retire and do everything and go for my life. And then I had to put it, I did put it on hold to help my kids through it and to help him. When you're paralyzed in both arms, there's not much you can oh. do. And it happens so quickly. And it was so hard to see someone go downhill that quickly. Um, so anyway, yeah, you've, you, you know, so many times we think, well, I mean, how many times do we even ask us, what would we love? What would we right. love in our life? What would we love to have, to be, to do, to share with other people, to give back to this world? What would we, what would a life of significance be for me? A lot of times we don't even stop and look up and I didn't, I was too busy achieving what, whatever, whatever the next step was supposed to be. But what did I want? I didn't really look at that. Or maybe I thought that's what I wanted, but we, we really, a lot of times don't take time and just stop and say, what would I love? And then when we do, well, I would love to be, you know, less busy, or I'd love to have a house on the beach, or I'd love to go on this trip, but I can't because of, you know, but what if you could, how do you know you can't? Our minds yeah. hold us back. You've got to be willing to try. And one of the fascinating things that we've talked a bit about is, um, you know, your vision doesn't come fully formed. You know, you, you know, we've talked about, obviously, visionaries that everybody knows, Walt Disney. He didn't have this big vision of Walt Disney World or whatever. He just, back in the 20s, thought, you know, cartoons could be better. They could tell a bit better story. And eventually mm -hmm. that led to Snow White and it just evolved. But he didn't have, he just had an idea and he started and that's the important thing is, is to start. And noticed <clears throat> as you look back on the name of your podcast, it evolved, right? Yeah. I think you think there were yeah. three things and obviously you would remember better than I, but first it was, you know, freeing yourself from anger or, or something. And then it's like second evolution was it authenticity. I forget what it was. And the third evolution was the inner, the, the inner journey. But there was an evolution right. in the names of it as yeah. you were evolving yourself in terms mm -hmm. of what your vision was, right? So that's sort of that's a way right. of charting the vision. How has Emily Harmon's vision changed? Well, just look at the names of the podcast, you know? Yeah. And that's not wrong. Well, that, 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 that's good, right? Yeah. And my awareness has shifted. You know, I, I interviewed my son, Will, um, in April of 2019, and right before I retired, and then um, published this podcast, you know, a few months later. But we were talking about his journey um you know drinking from age 13 to 23 and it was just it's the number one listen to episode that i have mm -hmm. and it's a really good episode but at that time i would have been somebody who would have said you know poor will he's drowning his feelings in alcohol i'm the mom i'm gonna i'm in this level three energy i'm gonna push through i'm gonna help him whatever right. um but I didn't realize that Emily was drowning her feelings in busyness. Mm. Clueless about that. Now I can look back and say, what's the difference between me and Will? Okay, he was getting drunk. Um, I kind of look at it when my condo gets kind of messy or, or whatever, that that is my hyperachiever, maybe restless, more restless saboteur. It's just like me going on a bank drinking binge is the way I kind of look at it myself. Maybe that's not right, but that's how I look at it. It's like, I got hijacked by my saboteur this week and got so busy that I wasn't doing what I said I wanted to do, which is pay more attention to who I'm being as I'm doing to be more in the flow. So when my condo starts to look like that, it's not a terrible mess, but I can, that tells me I'm not centered. And, that, and so I and I just started taking um, pottery with my mom, mm -hmm. and that was eye opening because that's like meditative, and you have to be in the present yeah. moment, and you have to get the clay balanced from the beginning. If you don't, you're gonna have a bowl that's not even, <laughs> right. and that's just like life. We have to be balanced, or else it reflects on everything that we do. 
you know, I, I've often thought that, you know, um, the inner journey or inner game is, it's a bit like exercise. You could say, well, I ran yesterday. Aren't I good for the next year? No. <laughs> you get flabby. You got to keep, you got to keep it up. And from an inner perspective, it, for me as a person of faith and for me in particular Christian faith, I do my daily Bible study, meditation. I've got my scripture memory. For others, it might be mantras or different faith perspectives that they pick up. Um, but that centers me if I'm feeling angry about something. I mean, one of the gifts I guess I have is I'm a very reflective person. I'm just wired mm -hmm. to reflect. So it's not hard for me to reflect. It's just like breathing. Um, not that I don't achieve, but if I'm if I'm feeling bad, like if it's personal, obviously I'll say to my wife, okay, I feel bad, I don't, I don't quite know why. If there are things that I know I'm not devastated by, but it's like a little ember. It could be a forest fire tomorrow. Today it's an ember. Here's an example that Gary's familiar with. Um, had this book come out, Crucible Leadership, late last year, and a gossip column in, I don't know, Sydney Morning Herald, one of the papers in Australia that you know we used to own, wrote some article saying, oh, oreg has got this book coming out, and he'll share it with you for a price. I mean, who shares a book for nothing? I mean, what's right. that about? And it was some <laughs> snarky little cartoon. Now, was I on the floor sobbing? No, I was irritated. But I knew if I let that little seed or that yeast grow, bad things will happen. So I talked to Gary, another one of the folks on my team, not because I was devastated, but I knew I am not going to let that little thing get traction. And I dealt with it. But if I hadn't dealt with that, you start going down, and, oh, my gosh, look what I did. 150-year-old company, and yet it was 4,000 people, and I called rifts in my family, and I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I hurt this, I hurt this. Hurt this. You start spiraling down, which is not helpful. You know? no. So it's like that inner journey is understanding who you are, and when those negative thoughts or negative vibes come, figure out ways that you know that you can deal with it. You know, put it out. Yeah. But it, you know, what you did is you weeded your garden, right? You saw exactly. you didn't let it get to be a huge weed. You pulled it right away. <laughs> so again, it's like exercise. You know, you want to help yeah. other people. You've got to be spiritually fit. You've got to be spiritually in good shape. And just because we're in good shape today doesn't mean we'll be in good shape tomorrow. It does mean we have tools. But, you know, don't just say, well, I, I went to counseling and, uh, you know, I got that assessment yesterday and you know, I was chatting to some close friends, so I'm good, right? I don't need to, I don't need to, I, I, I never need to talk to a close friend ever again about anything I've been through because I'm bulletproof. It's like, yeah, yeah. no, it doesn't work like that. No. So is it, does that make, does that make sense? Oh, it makes complete sense. Because initially when I was in uh, coaching with, uh, I was being coached and I'd be like, well, I don't, I don't think I really have anything else to work with them on, which was, you know, <laughs> then every time I'd meet, it's like, oh, it's so more and more. And then I started to realize, yeah, you're never really done. Right. But um, it, here's another thing that explains my, how far I've come. I was like, well, what, I, I know I want to be a coach, but what do I want to coach on? This is when I was getting ready to retire. Who's my target audience? I know it's women who are so busy. They can't, they can't get everything done. And I have accomplished so much. I'm really good at time management. I'm going to help them with their time management. That's where I was going to so, look at that. I've come from that far to now, like just be, and things will still get done. <laughs> oh, man. That is brilliant stuff. So as you think of your podcast and onward movement, uh, and I'm sure the vision will evolve and grow, as all good visions do. So in, if I asked you this question in 10 years' time, you'd, you'd probably have a slightly different answer. Maybe not radically different, but who knows? It would grow and flourish, right. as all good things do, like a you know, beautiful garden. But at least as of right now, what's sort of your, your dream that you hope for the people that listen to your podcast and Onward Movement? What's, what is the dream that you think, gosh, this is what I would love to give to these folks in some fashion i would love to help them what's what's kind of the core of your dream would you say i would just love to help them realize if they haven't already that there's more to life than just pushing hard life can be so joyful you can be so free from your mind you can be the observer of your mind you are not your mind. You're the awareness observing your mind. Knowing that 
and feeling it and living it are two different things. I'm feeling it and living it now for the most part. And it's awesome. And that's what I hope people will realize whether they come to me as a coach or go somewhere else, find a coach, you know, it, I think it's really hard to, to do that inner work without doing it with somebody. I think it's very challenging to, I don't know that I would, I would not be here on my own if I hadn't invested in coaches. So that's what I hope to help people who aren't living like that already, who see that, who are pointing to circumstances or other people, if only this would happen or this would change. And in some cases that might be perfectly right. But a lot of times we look at ourselves, we make these changes to ourselves, we improve ourselves, we go on this inner journey, our outer world changes. That's what I hope Mm. people see. That sound that you just heard, listener, was the captain turning on the fasten seatbelt sign. It's, it's about time we're taking our descent to land the plane. Before we do that, though, before you have to gather up your peanut bags and leave, before we land the plane, I would be remiss, Emily, if I didn't give you a chance to let listeners know how they could find out more about your services and about your uh, coaching practice. How can they find out more online? Um, the best place to go is just my website, Emily Harman, H-A-R-M-A-N.com. And there's a bunch of information there. And then also, you can also find the link to join the Onward Movement Facebook group. And then you can and to subscribe to my newsletter to listen to the podcast. And you can also follow me on LinkedIn. I broadcast my podcasts um, live on Wednesday nights at 730 even, evening in the evening, Eastern. Awesome. Before I turn it back to you, Warwick, for a final question, I just want to make an observation. Um, uh, And I hope, uh, listeners, that you'll become viewers and and, and go to our YouTube channel and watch this episode. Because what you'll see, when Emily started out talking, I've, I've been noticing it throughout. When she started out talking about her military career and what her life was like before, there was a, there was kind of a, sort of a serious cast to her face and the way she spoke. And then when she got into what she's doing with Onward Movement and what she's doing since she uh, is living the life that she really wants to live, she just, it was like her entire countenance changed. Mm -hmm. You probably heard it in her voice too, if you're just listening to audio, but you can really see it on video. And it's a beautiful thing, Emily, to watch that transformation right in front of us. So thank you for that gift. I'm like in tears because I'm so full of joy. Mm -hmm. That's really my life right now. And I never... Mm -hmm never thought I could find that. I never really, yeah, it's just amazing. I'm so happy. Work. Wow. the last question is yours. Yeah, wow. I mean, that, that is just so wonderful. I mean, you know, we talked about often the, the biggest journey is the journey within, I think, another journey that's almost like the Mount Olympus of inner work is to think that we are valued just because of who we are. You know, from my yeah. faith perspective, you know, uh, we're taught that uh, we're loved by God, we're children of God, we're, you know, sons and daughters of God, and we have value in of ourselves with our uh, foibles, our gifts, whether we're athletic, artistic, mathematical. You know, we don't. There's nothing we have to do to be more loved by certainly God or the universe. And for those friends and family, we're truly friends and family. There's nothing that we can do to earn more of their love. I'm sure that would be the case with your kids and close friends. They love you and care for you just because of who you are. And Mm -hmm. we need to surround ourselves with those sorts of people and realize, you know, you're doing what you do with Onward Movement and and, 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 Onward Podcast, not to achieve things, not to score another basket. You're doing that because it's a reflection of your desire to help people and just to be more fully Emily Harmon is to do that. It's an overflow of the inner light that's going on within, if you will. And I, and I think it's different ways, I think, of stating what you're stating, but does that make sense that that part of the, the Mount Olympus of inner journeys is to say, I matter just because I am, and there's nothing I can do, there's nothing I need to do to earn the universe or God's love more or other people. I have value in of myself. That frees you to actually help more people in some strange way. It's not achieving. The more you're doing yeah. the being work and the more I matter just because I am, 
somehow there's a sounds a little strange that's a radiance that will even radiate more does that any of this make sense just as we close it's so true it's so true and then you find yourself i mean initially in my journey i would find myself like oh i want to be like that coach or i want to be like that or i'm up behind her or, or whatever and now it's like there's no comparison i'm not comparing to other people everyone's on a different journey and the other thing that i would say is you know i never really grew up going to church um my parents both worked and on the weekends, they took us out hiking um, in the woods and in, in the mountains in the Shenandoah Valley, and they wanted to spend time with us. And um, that's how I, that's how I grew up. Um, it was, and I never really understood it when people said God told me something. It, it didn't make any sense to me. I, I'm like, God never talks to me. Well, of course he didn't, because I never was still enough to even friggin listen. I was just so busy. And so I relate to that term, the universe and my intuition. When I, when I get quiet and quiet my mind and meditate and connect with my higher self and the universe and thoughts come to me that I would not have thought of myself, that's God speaking to me. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. now I understand what people are saying, whereas before I, I never did. So if you're listening and you're like, I don't get it. I'm so busy. All, you're busy like me all the time. You can slow down. You can quiet your mind and you can hear God or the universe talking to you. And with that, we can put the plane on the ground. Dare I say the planes that we've been flying in this episode are U.S. Navy Blue Angel planes. <laughs> awesome. and, and, and they're on the ground. Um Listener, thank you for spending your time with us uh, in this very exciting and emotional conversation with Emily Harmon. Um, we ask you to, um, to uh, visit crucibleleadership.com. You can get Warwick's book. You can read blogs. You can explore more about the universe of what Crucible Leadership does uh, in addition to other episodes of this podcast that have come before. And until the next time we're together, we ask you to remember this, that, you're, that we know your crucible experiences are difficult. What Emily described today was, ex, was, ex, was extraordinarily difficult, what she went through. Warwick's crucible, as you all know, has been difficult. But if you learn the lessons from your crucible, which is what we're talking about here, how do you learn the lessons of them and how do you apply them? If you do that, as Emily has done it, we've listened to her talk about it for the last hour. She's applied the lessons of the crucible she's experienced, and what she has done with that is what you can do with the lessons from your crucible experiences, and that is chart a course to a new and better life, a life of significance. Mm -hmm.